Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Chapter five of our course on problems in international politics. We saw in our chapters three and four that on the Trump privileges, unilateral decisions and actions, inspired maybe by his Jacksonian tradition. This unilateral behavior regards notably America's participation in international regimes, international organizations, international treaties, multilateralism in other words, but Donald Trump goes pretty often as far as criticizing America's allies, America's political or military allies in the domain of security. He notably accused Japan of um, not paying, not contributing enough money to its defense, profiting from America's protection in the Far East. He also criticized NATO members of not paying their dues. So the question that we will have a look at today, the topic that we will tackle today regards NATO. What about NATO are the recently outbreaking disputes, at least in the publicly held discourses, speeches of the different statesmen of the members of NATO are these disputes. What do the disputes tell us about the nature of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization? And I would like to start this analysis with a quote, a quote that goes back to 2009, 2009, 2009, 11 years ago, when the then French president, Sarkozy, decided that France should reintegrate the unified military command of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. You know that the goal had decided that France should withdraw from this unified military command in 1966. And ever since 1966, up to 2009, France did not participate, though, of course, going on being a member of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So, Sarkozy so decided that France should reintegrate the military command, and he was criticized, obviously, by those here in France that either were nostalgic of the goal or those who claimed that France should be sovereign in the domain, notably of its defense, be they left wing, Mélenchon, or right wing notably uh, father and daughter Le Pen. So Sarkozy, of course, replied to these criticisms, and this is what he said, in order to justify his decision. America is our ally, America is our friend. America is our ally, America is our friend. Ever since 2009, things have evolved, of course. And I would like you to listen to three discourses that were held uh, for the last three years, two in 2017 and one last year. The first one is due to Donald Trump during the summit of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization 2017 in Brussels. Listen to Donald Trump. He criticizes the fact that American allies do not pay enough, do not spend enough money for their military budget, which to some extent amounts to saying that he is not that eager to be the friend, to take Sarkozy's expression, he's not that eager to be perceived as a friend of America's allies. Listen to Donald Trump. I have been very, very direct with Secretary Stoltenberg and members of the Alliance in saying that NATO members must finally contribute their fair share and meet their financial obligations. But 23 of the 28 member nations are still not paying what they should be paying and what they are supposed to be paying for their defense. This is not fair to the people and taxpayers of the United States. And many of these nations owe massive amounts of money from past years. 
and not paying in those past years. Over the last eight years, the United States spent more on defense than all other NATO countries combined. If all NATO members had spent just 2% of their GDP on defense last year, we would have had another $119 billion for our collective defense and for the financing of additional NATO reserves. So Trump is accusing the European allies of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization to free ride, as you say, to profit from America's military expenditures in order to guarantee its own protection. Let's now listen to Angela Merkel, the German Chancellor, during the summit, the G7 summit in 2017, her criticism uh, is broader than the mere uh, military domain. She accuses uh, the US and the UK in general uh, to, to act unilaterally, and she comes to the conclusion that Germany, and to some extent the other continental European Western powers or states, can no longer rely, trust uh, America rely upon America or trust America. Listen to Merkel, it is um, a presentation of, a, of a news. German Chancellor Angela Merkel has said Europe can no longer rely on its allies and must take its fate into its own hands. She made the remarks on Sunday at an election rally in Munich after returning home from the recent G7 summit in Italy. Luana reports. Speaking on Sunday after what she called unsatisfactory G7 talks, Merkel said the EU can no longer rely on its traditional British and American allies. However, she did mention that Europe had to forge its own path forward in tandem with friendly relations with the UK, the US and even Russia. The times in which we can fully counter others are somewhat over, as I've experienced in the past few days. And that is why I can only say we Europeans must really take our destiny into our own hands. Of course, in friendship with the United States, in friendship with Great Britain, and with good neighborly relations wherever possible, also with Russia and other countries. There were renewed concerns at the G7 summit in Italy as President Trump, who was attending the gathering for the first time, was the only leader to say he needed more time to think about committing to the 2015 Paris Agreement on climate change. He was also coming fresh off a NATO summit in Brussels where he lambasted allies for not paying enough for defence. Soon after the G7 talks, Merkel described the results as six against one, but didn't mention Trump by name. Thirdly, and this was very difficult if not to say very unsatisfactory, there was a whole discussion about the issue of climate change. Here we have situation of six G7 leaders, or seven, if you're counting the EU against one. Back in Munich, meanwhile, Merkel instead turned her hopes to pro-EU French President Emmanuel Macron. She said Germany would help wherever it could because Germany will only do well if Europe does well. Noada, Arida News. And last but not least, Macron. In a discourse held one year ago, 2019, he goes as far as saying that NATO is brain dead. NATO is under fire from French President Emmanuel Macron. What we are currently experiencing is the brain death of NATO. You have no coordination whatsoever of strategic decision making between the United States and its NATO allies. None. The president's comments come after the withdrawal of US troops from northeastern Syria. Fellow NATO member Turkey viewed the move as the green light for an incursion to push back Syrian Kurdish forces in the country, despite the risk that the chaos could give the Islamic State group an opening to mount a resurgence. Macron's comments were greeted with enthusiasm by the Russian Foreign Ministry. Golden words, true and reflective, a clear definition of the current state of NATO. But fellow NATO ally Germany was quick to dismiss the president's assessments. Um, they are France. The French president has chosen drastic words. I don't share that point of view regarding cooperation within NATO. I think such sweeping criticism isn't necessary, even though we do have some problems and need to fix them. 
Macron has also said he's no longer sure if the Allies would come to each other's defense if attacked, and he accused the US of turning its back on Europe. President Trump has repeatedly criticized members for not contributing the required 2% of their GDP to NATO. But on Thursday, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo also defended the organization. It is an absolute imperative that every country uh, participate and join in and contribute appropriately to achieving that shared security mission. World leaders will be meeting at a NATO summit in Britain next month. So I do think, ladies and gentlemen, after listening to these quotes and integrating Sarkozy's quotes too, that all these statements, all these statements perfectly sum up today's topic about the nature and maybe the future of NATO. If we establish a link between these statements and general international relations theories, international relations approaches, we can say that Sarkozy's statement, unconsciously of course, unconsciously, refers to what we may call a constructivist inspired analysis of NATO. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization is composed by friends. It is more than a mere alliance. It is what we may call a security community composed by friends. Trump's analysis consisting in uh, criticizing the members because they do not contribute enough to the budget of NATO. Trump's analysis, of course, echoes the traditional realist approach of alliances in general and therefore of NATO as an alliance, that is to say, as states joining their military forces because they have some common interests together, but not all interests in common. They still go on having specific interests, agoristic national interests, financial, economic one according to Trump. Merkel's reaction in 2017 and Macron's analysis or statement in 2019 are somewhere in between. They all at once would like NATO to go on being an efficient alliance if not even a real genuine security community, but they cannot but uh, assert, they cannot but see that various members, the US and the UK, according to Merkel in her first statement, Turkey and the US, according to Macron, France maybe, or Macron, according to Merkel's reaction to Macron's discussion to, 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 to um, uh, Macron's discourse, are accused of acting egoistically and therefore no longer respecting the objectives and the aims of NATO. So kind of mess, ladies and gentlemen, seems to characterize the North Atlantic Treaty Organization for some years now. And the question then we would like to ask, the question I feel free to ask is, should we worry about these disputes? Should we care about the quarrels opposing different members of NATO? Should we, should we be worried all the more so? Some years ago, Turkey decided to purchase Russian weapons, Russian missiles. How can a member of NATO buy Russian weapons rather than American or French or German or British weapons. Three years ago, one year ago, Trump, it's an illusion that uh, Macron made, decided to withdraw his troops from Syria unilaterally, despite the presence of French, British, etc., special forces. In doing so, he permitted Turkey to invade the north of Syria that he occupied. Part of the Kurdish territory, the Kurds had been fighting together with the French and British and the Americans against the Islamic State. And of course, Russia is profiting from this situation to consolidate the regime of Assad. 
you know that during uh, this summer 2020, so one or two months ago, a kind of confrontation opposed Greece and Turkey in Eastern Mediterranean Sea. And in Libya, France accused Turkey also to send troops and to interfere in Libya, in Libya's domestic troubles. So a lot of statements on the one hand, a lot of recent events that turned to prove or to indicate that NATO is now there's a troubled partnership, but the mere title is enchantment. The mere title tells us that things are more complicated. Why? Because this title, or the subtitle, The Troubled Partnership of today's class, is the title of a book written in 1965, in 1965, by Henry Kissinger, who analyzed the then North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And in 1965, as early as 1965, so 55 years ago, he already had come to the conclusion that the partnership between the US and its Western European allies was troubled. So we should maybe not be that worried because ever since NATO has been existing, these disputes have been existing too. Just to mention a few quarrels or crises. In 1956, during the Suez crisis, you know that the British and the French intervened to support Israel against Egypt. And this intervention was rejected, criticized by the US. So the first, this was the first significant quarrel between the US on the one hand and two Western European members of NATO, the French and the British on the other hand. In 1982, during the so-called Euro missile crisis, Germany, or a significant part, though not the German government, the then government of Helmut Kohl, but a very significant part of the German population was opposed to the US after America's decision to deploy uh, missiles in Germany, also in Italy and in Great Britain, to counter the Soviet S-20 missiles that the Soviets uh, had deployed to target Western Europe. So in order to rebalance, to reestablish a balance in the domain of middle range missiles, the Americans uh, deployed their missiles and a significant part of the German population protested. So this was a second significant crisis. And the last crisis that broke out in NATO occurred in 2003 when George W. Bush decided to invade Saddam Hussein, to invade Iraq and to topple, to overthrow Saddam Hussein, France. The then uh, French President uh, Chirac, the then French um, Foreign Secretary, Foreign Minister, De Vipa, uh, criticized George Bush, George Bush's decision to go to war without any UN resolution. Germany also criticized and various other European, Western European members, Belgium, etc. And Bush decided, he divided, sorry, uh, Europe, the European members between old Europe and new Europe, given the rift between the different members of NATO. So at least since it has been existing, NATO went through three very significant crises and always survived. So are today's quarrels more uh, serious? Should we, should we care about them or not? try to provide an answer to this question. Of course, a tentative answer as usual in social sciences, there is no definitive truth. You know what I will be doing, I will go back to history and I will use a theory, international relations theories. NATO was created, ladies and gentlemen, in 1949 on April 4, 1949. The US, Canada and 10 Western European states, you have the list on the first document of the file that you can find on Moodle. It was created on April 4, 1949. And the then Secretary General of NATO, the British Lord Ismay, summed up as follows the three objectives that according to him, NATO was pursuing, which wants to saying that the causes, the reasons of NATO's creation by the European, Western European states, 10 European, Western European states, plus the US, plus Canada. The reasons were the following one, causes were the following one. 
in some is up in the following phrase easy to remember keep the russians out keep the russians out keep the americans in keep the germans down so three objectives one explicit objective to keep the Russians out. In other words, the first objective of NATO was to defend the Western European states from a potential attack by the Soviets. The second aim, to keep the Americans in. This was an implicit objective. The aim was to consolidate America's leadership in the world by controlling, of course, Western Europe. And there was a kind of hidden objective to keep the former enemy, Germany, down, under control, in order to prevent, of course, any risk of Germany looking for a revenge as Hitler had done when he thought that Imperial Germany had been mistreated by the Versailles Treaty. So three objectives. Let's look at what these three objectives uh, became ever since <clears throat> 1949. Sorry. As soon as 1955, six years after the creation of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, Germany, or should I say, of course, Western Germany, became a full member of NATO. So the third objectives, keep the Germans down, no longer existed. You know that NATO integrated Western Germany in 1955 after the, the, the failure of the European defense community. This failure was due to the French Assemblée Nationale, the French Parliament, rejecting this uh, European defense community project in 1954. So in 1955, one of the three objectives no more existed. In 1991, the Soviet Union definitely collapsed. Soviet Union became Russia. There was no more Warsaw Pact, so there was no more reason to go on being eager, I quote the first objective, to keep the Russians out, since the Russians no longer were threatening the Western European states, since Russia was different by definition from the Soviet Union, against whom NATO had been created in 49. So the second objective no longer exists any longer either. And in 2020, Americans, however, are still in, to keep the Americans in, this objective is still valid, despite, of course, the different uh, disputes that I alluded to when quoting Trump or when quoting uh, Macron and Merkel. So to put it differently, two today, two out of NATO's original three purposes are obsolete. And yet, NATO is still alive and pretty well, fairly well. What does that mean? Does that mean that indeed NATO is more than a mere alliance? Does that mean that the realist analysis of NATO as an alliance should be replaced? by another approach. This is, ladies and gentlemen, exactly what constructivists claim, soft constructivists. They consider NATO to be mere than the mere alliance. They consider NATO to be a security community. In this lecture then, I will oppose these two uh, frameworks. I will propose first an analysis of NATO as an alliance. This is, I would say, or this at least used to be in the past, the predominant analysis in the discipline of international relations. NATO first and foremost is an alliance. And then I will have a look at the constructivist counter analysis. Uh, this constructivist approach emerged, of course, after the end of the Cold War and was pretty successful, at least up to the very recent disputes that I mentioned at the beginning of today's class. So let's begin with the realist approach and therefore with the definition of an alliance. What is an alliance, ladies and gentlemen? 
The best book on alliances is due to Stefan Wald. Please do not confound with Kenneth Wald. This is Stefan Wald, The Origins of Alliances. It is a book which dealt with alliances in the Middle East during the Cold War. And Stefan Wald, being a realist, claims that the alliances in the Middle East have absolutely no link with the domestic political regimes or could we say the, 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 um, the cultural or civilizational uh, characteristic of the different states. And uh, this analysis, ladies and gentlemen, is all the more so, I would say, um, significant. If we look at nowadays what is happening, you'll learn that two or three weeks ago, the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain recognized Israel's right to exist, though claiming that they are favorable to the Palestinians. So to some extent, what is happening nowadays in the Middle East, we come back to this in another chapter, of course, at least indirectly corroborates the realist analysis of alliances in the Middle East. What concerns, what regards NATO things may be different, but according to realists, NATO first and foremost is an alliance, that is to say, and here stands the definition, a formal or informal relationship of security cooperation between two or more than two sovereign states. I repeat, an alliance is a formal or an informal relationship of security cooperation between two or more than two sovereign states. Between two states, this is a bilateral alliance, for instance, the US and Japan, for instance, the US and South Korea. A mul a more than two sovereign states is a multilateral alliance, a multilateral cooperation. This is the case of um, NATO, of course. Formal or informal, an informal alliance, by definition, is a coalition. But the coalition sometimes can uh, constitute as strong as a relationship, though being informal, than a formal one, than an alliance. If you take uh, the American-Israeli relationship, there is no alliance, there is no formal alliance, but it is an informal coalition and the ties, the links between the two states are as strong as the ties between various uh, NATO members, of course. So the realists, by claiming, by positing that alliances are cooperation, constitute cooperation in the domain of security, of course, establish a link between the state's decision to join alliances, to create alliances, and their obligation to look for security in an anarchical setting where there is no authority above states, where there is no authority controlling what states do or what they do not do. Realists, therefore, address the question of alliances and they propose an analysis of the nature of, of alliances by looking at the more general balance of power that, according to them, states have to maintain in order to guarantee their security. And they look, therefore, at alliances through the lenses of the balance of power principle all at once to explain why alliances are created, the origin of alliances, how alliances work once they are created, the working, the functioning of alliances, and the third point, they explain how long an, uh, an alliance is likely to last. The duration of alliances also is linked to the more general balance of power principle. So let's look at the realist explanation of the origin of alliances, the origins of alliances. According to realists, mainstream or the majority of realists, adherence, we saw this in other chapters, to the balance of power principle, there is a kind of classic, I quote Kissinger, there is a kind of classic lesson of history. According to this lesson, states can never be safe when there is one state more powerful than themselves. 
This means that in order to try to feel safe, in order to maintain their security, they have to establish or re-establish a balance of power. They have to prevent any other state from possessing more military resources than themselves, than themselves individually or than themselves combined, all the other ones combined. This, in other words, amounts to claiming that, according to realists, alliances exist because of either the internal balancing strategy or the external balancing strategy. I would like to quote Hans Wolfenthal in his Politics Among Nations, the book that was published immediately after World War II. Listen to Morgenthau in the chapter called Different Methods of the Balance of Power. Alliances, I quote, are a necessary function of the balance of power operating within a multiple state system. Alliances are a necessary function of the balance of power. Concretely, in order to maintain the balance, in order to make sure that all the states roughly have the same amount of military resources, that none of them is stronger than the other ones, states have the choice between two possibilities, between two strategies. Either internal balancing, they increase their own military resources to make sure that their resources match any other state's resources, military capacities, or they practice external balancing, that is to say, they create alliances. And this is exactly what Morgenthau uh, puts forward when states make the first choice, when they increase their arms, their armaments, they embark on an armament race in order to maintain balance, equality. When they choose the second, when they create an alliance, when they practice external balancing, I quote, they pursue a policy of alliances. They pursue a policy of alliances. In other words, to put it differently, in order for an alliance to emerge, to be created, to be established, two or more than two states must share a common interest in putting their military resources together. I repeat, in order for an alliance to exist, to be established, two states must share a common interest in putting their resources, their military capacities together, either because they are too weak to practice an internal balancing strategy, they are not sure that by increasing their own resources, these resources will match the other state's resources. Or, of course, because they want to complete, to complement their own internal balancing by an external balancing strategy, that is to say, by joining their resources, their military capacities to the military capabilities of the other state. Alliances, therefore, according to realists, the majority of realists, are ultimately, basically, due to the material distribution of power resources in the international system. When there is an imbalance, and even when there is a risk of a future imbalance, when it is possible that one state becomes stronger than all the other ones, then states are led to adopt a balancing strategy consisting in establishing alliances. Morgenthau gives a lot of historical examples. The alliances that François I concluded with Henry VIII in order to prevent Charles V, Habsburg, Charles V, from expanding his empire. These alliances are the first modern example of the balance of power, Otto Premier and Henry VIII. 
in the second, second example, in the second half of the 17th century, Louis XIV took over the role of Habsburg. He was eager that France became the preeminent power on the continent. In the second half of the 17th century, Louis XIV took over the role of the Habsburgs and <clears throat> his ambitions provoked a similar reaction among the other European nations. The Dutch and the English created alliances with the purpose, I quote, of protecting the European nations from the French domination by establishing a new balance of power between France and the rest of Europe, since France was um, perceived to be eager to dominate the British and the Dutch created an alliance to maintain or to rebalance the system. And last but not least, the third example concerns the Cold War, that is to say NATO. <coughs> Similarly, the Western bi- and multilateral alliances have, since the late 40s, when he wrote his book, since the late 40s, pursued the objective of putting a halt to stop the imperialistic expansion of the Soviet Union through the creation of a balance of power. The aim of NATO is to maintain a balance of power between its members and the Soviet Union. In other words, the decision to form alliances or to join alliances is a rational decision. It is a rational decision taken by states in their search for security. Alliances are formed if their expected utility is positive in maintaining or re-establishing the balance because this balance is perceived as a condition for states to feel safe. Once again, <clears throat> Morgenthal, sorry, whether or not a nation will pursue a policy of alliances is a question of expediency, utility, not of principle. Expediency, usefulness, utility, not of principle. A nation will avoid alliances if it believes that it is strong enough not to be helped, if it can practice internal balancing, or if it believes that the burden of the commitments, the negative consequences of creating an alliance are likely to be more important than the expected advantages. So to create an alliance is a rational cost advantage decision. If the state believes that thanks to this alliance, it will benefit from a safer security. If this safer security is considered to be more important than the prospective negative consequences of entering an alliance, then this state will indeed create or join an alliance. And the same idea, of course, is put forward by all the realists, Kenneth Waltz, Theory of International Politics, very short, but very clear. Alliances are made by states that have some, but not all, their interests in common. States that have some interests in common create alliances. The common interest is ordinarily a negative one, the fear of other states. When states are afraid, scared by other states, then they may create alliances because of this common interest to cope with this other state. And the last realist contemporary one, John Mersheimer, shares the same analysis. Threatened states can take various measures to make balancing work. They can create a defensive alliance to, can, to contain their opponent, their dangerous opponent. They can. They must not, but they can. There is no obligation, but it is a possibility. 
by creating a state, the costs of check, by creating an alliance, sorry, the costs of checking an aggressor are shared among the different members. So there is an interest, of course, in creating such an alliance. Furthermore, recruiting allies increases the amount of firepower confronting the aggressor. Therefore, this aggressor, of course, should behave moderately when he is confronted by an alliance. So the majority of realists claim that alliances are created when one power on the international scene, on the world political stage, either possesses or is likely to possess in the future more military capacities than the other states. This is the traditional balance of power theory. This balance of power theory has been revisited. It has been revisited by Stephen Walt, he whom I already quoted with his book, The Origins of Alliances. Stephen Walt adds or somehow changes. He adds to the balance of power theory what he calls the balance of threat theory, the balance of threat theory, which should be distinguished, therefore, from the traditional balance of power theory. In the balance of power theory, according to Mortar, according to Waltz, according to Mersheimer, alliances are created to cope with the objective amount of military capacities possessed, controlled by another state, an opponent state. The objective material reality. Stephen Walt introduces a new element, a kind of subjective perception that this material strength possessed by the opponent also represents a subjective threat, a subjectively felt threat. Listen to Stephen Walt. Balancing, page 21, balancing is usually framed solely only in terms of capabilities, objectively measured amounts of weapons. Balancing is alignment with, alignment with the weaker side. Two states possessing less weapons than a third one do create a balance, do create an alliance to balance the third. This conception should be revised, however, and here then he proposes his contribution. It should be revised to account for the other factors that statesmen consider when deciding with whom they should ally. Although power is an important part of the equation, it is not the only one. Here then is his innovation. It is more accurate to say that states tend to ally against the foreign power that poses the greatest threat. States do not balance another state's power material objective power resources states according to Walt not to be confounded with Waltz ladies and gentlemen according to Walt states balance those states that represent a threat for example I go on quoting states may balance by allying with other strong states if a weaker power is considered to be more dangerous for other reasons. And he gives the example of World War I and World War II. In World War I, at the eve of World War I, or at least when the Triple Entente was created by the British and by the Russians and by the French, Great Britain still was more powerful than Germany. Why then did the French and the Russians accept to create the Triple Entente because they felt a threat emanating from Germany, though Germany, objectively speaking, was less strong, less powerful in material resources, military capacities than Great Britain. But for the French and for the Russians, the threat came 
from Germany, not from Great Britain. I go on quoting Stefan Walsh, states that are viewed, perceived as aggressive, rather than states that are known to be more powerful, states that are viewed as aggressive, are likely to provoke others to balance against them, to balance against them. And I would like to permit you to better understand the difference between balance of power and balance of threat by having a look at the two quotes that I put forward on the third document of the file you can find on Moodle. The two quotes are of past British statesmen. The first one is due to Winston Churchill, put forward by Morgenthau in favor of his traditional balance of power. He quotes Churchill saying, putting forward the following analysis in 1936 when summing up Great Britain's uh, strategy. For 400 years, the foreign policy of Great Britain has been to oppose the strongest, to oppose the strongest, the state that acquires, possesses more military capacity. Faced, I go on quoting Churchill as quoted by Morgenthau, faced by Philip of Spain, Louis and Napoleon of France, Willem of Germany, so 1936, Hitler was not yet starting, had not yet started his war. It would have been easy and it must have been tempting to join with the stronger and to share the fruits of the conquest. However, we British always took the harder course, joined with the less strong powers, the less strong, objectively speaking, powers, made a combination among them, created an alliance, then defeated the continental power that was too powerful. Whoever it was, the policy of England, and here we have exactly the meaning of the balance of power, according to the majority of realist states when establishing an alliance, look at the objective material configuration of powers. The policy of England takes no account of which nation it is that seeks to dominate Europe. The question is not whether it is Spain or the French monarchy or the French Empire, Napoleon, or the German Empire, William II, or the Nazi regime. The British policy has nothing to do with rulers or nations. It is only concerned with whoever is the strongest. So Great Britain, according to Churchill, as quoted by Morgenthau to illustrate the balance of power theory, Great Britain creates alliances on the basis of the objective distribution of power resources. Alliances are created to prevent any state from being too Stephen Waltz takes another quote from British history. He quotes the British diplomat Sir Eyre Crow saying in 1907 at the eve of World War I the following, putting forward the following analysis, Great Britain has not been opposed to the predominance of a state when it seemed to make for peace and stability. It is only when the dominant power on the continent becomes aggressive. It is only when the dominant power becomes aggressive that Great Britain gravitates to anything that can be described as a balance of power. In order, in, in order, in, to put it differently, according to Sir Eyre Crow, Great Britain throughout the four centuries practiced, practiced an offshore balancing strategy in order to cope with threats emanating on the continent. The mere fact for a continental power to possess military capacities was not sufficient to uh, incite Great Britain to maintain the balance. First and foremost, 
one of the continental powers also had to behave aggressively. That is to say, a threat had to emanate from one of the continental powers in order for Great Britain to create alliances or coalitions in order to put an end to this threat. So balance of power versus balance of threat, objective balance of power versus subjective balance of threat. And when we look at, ladies and gentlemen, the historical record, when we look notably in 1945, obviously it is Stephen Waltz balance of threat theory, which, which is empirically corroborated that not Morgenthau's or Kenneth Waltz's or Kissinger's or Mersheimer's balance of power theory. In 1945, we saw this in our chapter one or two. In 1945, Great Britain, um, Great Britain, 1945, the US was by far the most powerful state. So if then the balance of power principle had been uh, put into practice by the Western European states, they should have created an alliance with, ladies and gentlemen, the Soviet Union to rebalance the prevailing power of the US. But this is not what France, Great Britain, and a bit later Germany, Italy, etc., did. What did they do? They created an alliance. They asked the US to create the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Why? Because the threat that they perceived was emanating from the USSR, despite the USSR being less, materially speaking, powerful militarily, militarily speaking, less powerful than the predominant American superpower. In other words, it is uh, Stephen Waltz about the threat theory, which is a better explanation of why NATO was created than the more general balance of power theory. Anyway, what I want you to remember is that for realists, regarding the origin of alliances, why are alliances created? According to realists, alliances are created when some states, at least two or more than two, are eager to cope successfully with a danger. I use the term danger. This danger can be objectively consisting in superior military capacities by another state, or it can consist in subjectively felt threat emanating from a third party state, from a state that, of course, is not a member of the alliance. States, I repeat, according to realists, create alliances in order to cope with a threat, when, with, to cope with a danger. When there is no danger, there will be no alliance. The origins of alliances. Let's now come to the realist explanation of the working of alliances. Once alliances are created, how do they function? According to realists, ladies and gentlemen, Once an alliance is created, the members of an alliance go on behaving egoistically. They go on behaving egoistically. In other words, they first and foremost want to promote their national interest besides the common interest, which was at the origin of the creation of the alliance. In other words, power politics characterizes the behavior of states within the alliance, just as it characterizes states in general on the international stage. States, when they are members, go on behaving egoistically. This is first and foremost true for the leaders of the alliance. And Kent Waltz is the one who analyzed the working of alliances during the Cold War in his theory of international politics. He considers that both in the Warsaw Pact, the Soviet counter-alliance, and in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, it is the leader, that is to say the USSR and the US, who decide what the common policy of 
the alliance will consist. In other words, there is no perfect unity in the alliance, and therefore there are regularly disputes breaking out, just as the ones that I alluded to with my quotes of Trump, with my quote with Merkel. Listen to Kenneth Wall's theory of international parties, even with the greatest external pressure, even when there is a danger emanating from a third party state, the unity of alliances is far from being complete. Alliances, the unity of alliances is far from being complete. States continue to look for their advantage. States continue to look for their advantage. In alliances among unequals, when there is a superpower leading an alliance and weaker secondary powers, which is the case in NATO, which was the case in the Warsaw Pact, in alliances among unequals, the contributions of the lesser members, the weaker states, are necessary, but nevertheless of relatively small importance. The contribution to NATO of France or of Belgium or of Luxembourg, of course, is less important than the American country. Alliance leaders worry little about the faithfulness of their followers who use, usually have little choice anyway. So you see the inequality. Alliance leaders worry little about the faithfulness of secondary members. These secondary members, however, have usually little choice anyway. To some extent, this is echoing. To Kennedy's claim in the median dialogue, the strong do what they want and the weak accept what they must. The weak members must accept what the leader of an alliance, the strong leader, tells them. They have to accept. So the contributions of secondary powers are useful, of course, but they are not indispensable. Because they are not, the policies and strategies of alliances are ultimately made. This is the important point. The policies and strategies of alliances are ultimately made according to the alliance leaders' own calculations and interests. It is the US that uh, imposes the policy that will be adopted by NATO. And he ends up by saying that this is the case both in the Warsaw Treaty Organization also pact organization and in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So for a realist, a hardcore realist such as Kenneth Walls, alliances are not different from power politics in general. The strong do what they want, the weak accept what they have to. In other words, states are allies temporarily because they share some common interests. They are anything but friends. So leaders do behave egoistically and in general states within alliances do or coalitions do behave egoistically too and this is what John Mersheimer is analyzing with his concept of buck passing. Buck passing. What does that mean? According to John Mersheimer, alliances have always a kind of dark side. Why? Because in order for alliances to adopt a common policy, they have to consult. They have to come to common conclusions and this process is pretty often long and slow and inefficient. So to make alliances work smoothly is pretty difficult. And therefore states are not that eager to cooperate. Just think of what happened in the 1990s when NATO intervened militarily in Kosovo, in Bosnia and in Kosovo, before agreeing upon which targets should be bombed by NATO aircraft in order to defeat the Serbian or the pro-Serbian forces that were practicing ethnic cleansing in Bosnia or in Kosovo. The more than 20 at that time members of NATO had to agree. The US, in other words, had to ask uh, the authorization of tiny Luxembourg. And I remember that at that time, American generals, of course, were anything but happy with this reality. So what do then 
alliances do what do alliance members do in order to try to find an advantage when creating an alliance well they i quote they have an impulse they have an incitation they are incited to buck pass among themselves to buck pass among themselves that is to say they want to escape the negative consequences of alliances by the negative consequence which consists in having to oppose a common enemy by trying to get another member to bear the burden of fighting against the common enemy. This is back passing at the example given by uh, Mersheimer regards a coalition, not a formal alliance, but an informal alliance, a coalition, the coalition of anti-Nazi powers during World War II. The US, I quote, entered World War II in December 1941 after Pearl Harbor, but it did not land its army in France until June 44, D-Day, June 6, 1944. That is to say, less than one year before the war ended in Europe, the war ended on May 8, 45. Why did the US decide to wait until 1944, June 6th, before landing in Normandy? In order for the burden, I quote, of fighting against the formidable Wehrmacht, the German Nazi army, in order for this burden, to fall, to fall, sorry, on the shoulders of the Soviet Union. It was in America's interest to see the Soviets fighting during long years against the Germans before themselves intervening massively against the Germans by deciding to land on D-Day, June 6. In other words, even within a coalition or an alliance, all the states try to pursue their interest before looking for the common interest. And it is irrational to act this way. States are egoists. An alliance is not an end in itself. It is just an instrument, a means to an end, to the state's security. So it is logical for every state, it is rational for every state to try to obtain the highest possible positive uh, results, consequences, and to avoid as far as possible the negative consequences of putting one's forces together. So states are egoistic when they create an alliance, they have a common interest to do so, otherwise they would not. They are egoistic as long as the alliance is working, as long as it is existing. And point number three, according to realists, alliance states are egoistic when it comes to decide whether an alliance should go on, should last, or should not. So let's have a look at the duration of alliance. According to realists, alliances are by definition short-lived. Alliances by definition only exist Temporarily, they exist as long as the danger that they try to cope with, be it the threat or the power of a third party state, as long as this danger is existing. Once the danger no more exists, by definition, the alliance is bound to collapse. Listen to Morgan Chow. General alliances are typically of temporary duration. While alliance treaties have frequently assumed the permanent validity when signing a treaty, the states concerned commit themselves to remain together over a long and a long period, etc. While alliance treaties have frequently assumed the permanent validity, they could not have been more durable than the generally precarious configurations of common interests which they were intended to serve. Alliances last as long as there is the common interest to cope 
with a common danger. This is what Lord Palmerston, the British Foreign Secretary, who then became the British Prime Minister a bit later in the 1850s, summed up. England has no permanent friends. England has no perpetual enemies. It only has permanent interests that it should defend and promote. So today's enemy may become tomorrow's ally. Today's ally may become tomorrow's adversary. And contemporary realists, of course, agree with this analysis. Stephen Walt, alliances are a response to an external threat. Threat rather than power, balance of power. We saw this, but we could say alliances are a response to an external danger. States join forces in order to balance against the threats, the common threat that they face. It follows that alliances will dissolve. Alliances will dissolve when there is a significant shift in the threat, in the level of threat that its members face. When there is a shift in that threat or in the danger, then alliances should dissolve, should collapse. Ladies and gentlemen, in 1989-1991, there was such a shift in the threat or the danger that the members of the Atlantic Alliance were facing. Why? Because in 1991, the USSR collapsed. So the objective material military capacities that had been, that were possessed by the USSR before its collapse no longer existed. So the majority of realists should come to the conclusion there is no more material, a materially significant military capacity uh, controlled by the USSR. Therefore, NATO can hardly survive. And, of course, in 1991, since the USSR turned into Russia, and since Russia was no longer a communist regime, which throughout the Cold War had been perceived as inherently aggressive, expansionist, the subjectively felt threat no longer existed either. So both from the objective balance of power standpoint and from the subjective balance of threat point of view, NATO could hardly survive the end of the Cold War. And this is very exactly what Kenneth Waltz himself anticipated in an article, not in this book, but in an article that was published in 1993, and which I put in the final move, document number four. Listen to Kenneth Waltz. We must wonder how long NATO will last as an effective organization. We must wonder how long NATO will last as an effective organization. As is often said, organizations are created by their enemies. Alliances are organized against their perceived the threats. He even accepts Stephen Wald's balance of threat theory. Alliances are organized against their perceived the threats. How can an alliance endure in the absence of a worthy opponent? There is no more worthy opponent. The USSR no longer exists, 1993. There is no more threat. NATO's, listen to this, the last sentence, NATO's days are not numbered, NATO's days are not numbered, but its years are. So in 1993, Kenneth Walsh, the best and the brightest neorealist, American neorealist, expected NATO to collapse. 27 years, ladies and gentlemen, after this prediction was published, we are in 2020, NATO is still alive. It did not. Um, collapse. It is still alive, it is pretty well, despite the tensions we alluded to at the beginning. It is all the more so well since, since all the more so since um, 
since the end of the, the Cold War, it admitted a dozen of new members. You have the list on the final moon. It redefined its missions and its objectives. It staged military interventions, which it never had done throughout the Cold War in uh, Yugoslavia, former Yugoslavia, 1995, Bosnia, 1999, Kosovo. It intervened militarily against Libya in 2011. And it participated in uh, establishing state building policies in uh, um, protecting state building operations in Iraq after Operation Desert Storm and in Afghanistan after Operation Injury Freedom against the Taliban. So NATO's survival, of course, is a problem for realists since they claim that an alliance cannot uh, live longer, last longer than the threats that it's supposed to cope with. And this refutation of the realist approach, or this difficulty for the, real, for the realist approach, was summed up by British Prime Minister Tony Blair in 1999, that is to say, during uh, the ceremony celebrating NATO's 50th anniversary, 1949-1999. This is what Tony Blair said. It is rare to see a politician, he talked of himself, attend a meeting of an alliance elder than himself. He was less than 50. In other words, it is very rare to see an alliance last 50 long years and all the more so since the enemy at the origin of its creation no longer existed. If then the realist analysis is no longer convincing or at least has some problems, has some difficulties to explain why NATO survived, we have to look for an alternative approach. And this alternative approach maybe is put forward by another realist, albeit despite himself, Kissinger, in his diplomacy published in 1994, so five years after the end of the Cold War, four years and a half after the Cold War, the end of the Cold War, two years and a half after the collapse of the USSR. Listen to Kissinger in his diplomacy, page 819. NATO served the geopolitical purpose of keeping Europe from falling under the rule of the USSR. NATO served the purpose of keeping Europe from falling under the rule of the USSR. What came to be called, at the origin it was not the case, but what came in 49, but what came gradually throughout the Cold War, listen to this, what came to be called the Atlantic Community, what came to be called the Atlantic Community, a nostalgic term, has been marking time since the collapse of communism. Since there is no more communist adversary, we no longer talk, call, no longer talk of the Atlantic community. It has been marking time. America now, he talks of the beginning of the 90s, America now seems to be giving less attention to societies that have similar institutions and with which it shares common attitudes on human rights, and other basic values. So the Atlantic community, this is the term used by Kissinger when talking of NATO. NATO at the beginning was uh, created to cope with the Soviet threat. Throughout the decades, it gradually was called the Atlantic community, but in the beginning of the 90s, this Atlantic community has been marking time because as a realist, Kissinger thinks that America, since it no longer has the Soviet enemy, no longer needs to cooperate with those states that share the same values, human rights, the same institutions within this community. And it is precisely this term, community, which according to Kissinger is no longer characterizing NATO after the end of the Cold War, it is this term community that is at the core of the alternative, that is to say the constructivist approach of NATO as a security community, as more 
than a mere Allah. So let's look at this, let's have a look at this alternative constructivist approach. This approach was put forward after the end of the Cold War to explain why NATO survived despite the collapse of the USSR. But of course, retrospectively, it was used to explain also the origin, the beginning of NATO, and how it worked throughout the Cold War. The concept of security community. This concept was proposed as early as 1957 by the American scholar Karl Deutsch in Princeton. I put definition of security community in document number five. On the file you can find a Moodle. A security community I call it, is a group of people which has become integrated. A group of people which has become integrated. What is then Integration. By integration, we mean the attainment within a territory of a sense of community and of institutions and practices strong enough, strong enough to guarantee for a long time expectations of peaceful change. Expectations of peaceful change. A security community, ladies and gentlemen, is a set of states, a group of states expecting that peace will prevail among one another. In other words, it is a group of states that who have internalized the conviction that their conflicts in the strict meaning of divergent interests should and can be resolved peacefully without any resort to violence. The security community, I want quoting, is a group of entities, in this case states, sovereign states, the members of, of the security community. The security community is a group of entities convinced that their problems must and can be resolved by peaceful change without resort to physical force. Obviously, this is the case of NATO. We cannot imagine nowadays Germans going to war against French, French against British, British against Belgian, Belgian against Dutch, the Dutch against Italians, etc., the Canadians against the Americans, etc., etc. But this definition, the first definition of security communities put forward more than 60 years ago is, is almost completely negative. It focuses, it emphasizes the fact that states do resolve negatively, um, do resolve peacefully their uh, conflict. There is a more positive definition or conception of security communities due to two contemporary constructivist scholars, Emmanuel Adler and Michael Barnett. In their book, Security Communities, this is how they do define a security community. A security community is characterized by three major characteristics, three major characteristics. Members of a community have shared identity, Shared identities, values, and meanings. Shared identities, values, and meanings. They have many and direct relations occurring through face to face encounters. They meet regularly and they exhibit a reciprocity that expresses some degree of long term common interests and even altruism. Even altruism. That is to say, they include the other members' national interest in their definition of their own national interest. In other words, security communities are made by states who, whose national interest includes the national interest of the other member, which amounts to saying that members of a security community are what Alexander Wendt called friends. And we thus come back to Sarkozy's expression, America is our ally, America is our friend. Though Sarkozy, of course, unconsciously used this term and not in the constructivist meaning. Security communities are the example of what Alexander Wendt calls Kantian anarchical culture. We will come back to this in another chapter. The Kantian anarchical culture is a culture shared by friends who consider other states 
not merely as partners, as rivals, as enemies, but as friends, which amounts to saying that they include in the definition of their national interest, the national interest of the other state. When then applying this conception to NATO, what can we say regarding the origin? Obviously, NATO was created to cope with the Soviet danger, threat, and power. But maybe you know, and this is pretty often forgotten, often in France, all the more so, NATO was created not by the US, but by the Europeans. That is to say, it is the European, the Western European powers, France, Belgium, the Netherlands, and um, Italy and England, Great Britain, who asked, were the first to be eager to create a common transatlantic defense or North Atlantic defense. The US, remember what we saw last week, since George Washington, the first president in his farewell address, had rejected entangling alliance. It did not want to have, to have its hand tied. So in 1949, America accepted to become, for the first time in its history, a member of a long-term alliance, accepting to tie its hands. America could have chosen either bilateral alliances with each Western European state, this is what it did with Japan, this is what it did with South Korea. There is no Far Eastern equivalent to NATO. It could have chosen to establish something like the Warsaw Pact with the USSR dominating the other satellite states. US could have dominated its Western European allies. But this is not what America did. America established a multilateral organization based on the indivisibility of security, on diffused reciprocity, on democratic decision-making procedures. This is the analysis of the German Thomas Riese Kappen in this book, The Culture of National Security. That is to say, the US decided in 1945 or 1949 that it would no longer act unilaterally when dealing with Western European affairs. It adopted multilateralism. And therefore, it conceived NATO, I quote a Belgian theorist, Joint N. It conceived of NATO not as an alliance, but as the expression, I quote, of an association of like minded nations. An association of like minded nations. After World War II, the US accepted to have its hands tied, that is to say, to intervene militarily in favor of its Western European allies, even if its own security was not directly at stake. And regarding the democratic decision-making procedures, to have an idea of it, we just have to look at the treaty, the North Atlantic Treaty that was signed on April 4, 1949. Listen, look at document number two, article four of this treaty. The parties will consult together. They will consult together. Whenever, in the opinion of any of them, the territorial integrity, the political independence, or the security of any of the parties is threatened. When the security is threatened of one member state, all the other states will consult. They will take a decision together. This is not, ladies and gentlemen, therefore Kenneth Waltz is wrong. This is not what the USSR did in 1956, in 1968, when it decided to send Red Army and the other troops in Budapest, to Budapest or to Prague, to crush the attempt to get rid of the dead prevailing communist Stalinist regime. America never used this strategy. America collectively consulted all the other member states when it came to undertake an action. And we thus come to, number, to the second point, the working of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, ladies and gentlemen, you know that the USSR deployed uh, missiles in Cuba. 
the Americans could have chosen to bomb them, to destroy them. There was, of course, the risk of the Soviet Union retaliating in general, but there was also another reason why the Americans decided not to bomb, but to establish a quarantine line around the island of Cuba to prevent other Soviet ships from bringing other missiles to Cuba. This other reason is the fact that America had in mind what the Soviets might do to Berlin. And here we have the very precise meaning of friendship or of security community, as pronounced by John F. Kennedy in his famous Ich bin ein Berliner speech. I am a citizen of Berlin. Listen to this speech, 19. 61. There are many people in the world who really don't understand or say they don't. What is the great issue between the free world and the communist world? Let them come to Berlin. There are some who say that communism is the wave of the future. Let them come to Berlin. even a few who say that it's true that communism is an evil system but it permits us to make economic progress let's see not berlin in common let them free men, wherever they may live, are citizens of Berlin. And therefore, as a free man, I take pride in the words, Ich bin ein Berliner. Ich bin ein Berliner. I am a citizen of Berlin, though being American. What happens in Berlin directly? Um, concerns my own security, though the security is not necessarily at stake. Ich bin ein Berliner. This speech perfectly sums up the friendship, uh, rather than merely the alliance, that the links of alliance that links the US to its Western European, to the Western European member states of NATO. And regarding the functioning, the working of NATO as an organization, there is no doubt that indeed the US, the burden of financing the North American Treaty Organization, this burden was paid by the US. So to some extent, Trump asks its allies to pay more. But whatever his intentions, up to now, it is America which paid as a kind of hegemon, benign and even benevolent hegemon for the protection of the European, the Western European allies. So the burden sharing problem uh, put forward by Trump, but it had already been put forward by other American presidents in the 70s and the 80s, etc., should not make us forget that since 1949, it is America which is paying for the protection of the Western European continent, the Western European states. In, of course, the case there was such a threat, which is another question. Last but not least, the alternative constructivist explanation or analysis of NATO, of course, is corroborated by the survival 
of NATO after the end of the Cold War. If NATO survived despite the collapse of the Warsaw Pact, it is because there are positive elements shared by its members and not merely negative elements, that is to say the common fear of the danger emanating from the USSR or from communism. And this, this positive point, of course, are the values, the identities, the norms, the standard of living and the way of life that is shared on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. Thus, it is not at all surprising that in 2001, the day after the terrorist attacks of 9-11, the French journalist Jean-Marie Colombani, then head of the French newspaper Le Monde, published an editorial entitled, Nous sommes tous Américains, we all are Americans. You can find this article, this editorial on the file on Moodle. We all are Americans. We were not hit by the planes running into, flying into the World Trade Center towers. But we are Americans. We are suffering from what America is enduring because of these attacks. We are friends, we share the same values. And despite George W. Bush's unilateral decision to go to war against Iraq with the dispute with the French and the Germans who refused uh, to accept this strategy, with this exception ever since 2001, and up to Donald Trump, there is no doubt that the constructivist analysis explains better than the realist analysis why NATO is still existing nowadays. So in relative terms regarding NATO, and of course, future will tell us if this will still be the case or not, nobody can predict the future. Up to now, ladies and gentlemen, up to now, the constructivist approach of NATO is superior, theoretically speaking, to the realist one because it is empirically more corroborated, better corroborated than the realist one. And in social science, this is important. No, I already told you, no theory is corroborated 100%. So a theory is good or bad, not in absolute terms, but in relative terms. It is good or bad in relative terms, that is to say, it is a good one if it provides a better explanation of a social, in this case, international process or event, then a contending theory, then a rival theory. And regarding NATO, at least NATO's survival, and maybe also NATO's working, the realist approach does not account for empirical reality, the constructivist one does. The future, future will tell us, ladies and gentlemen, whether this will be true or not on the long run. Thank you very much for listening to today's class. Have a great day and I hope you come back to our next chapter next week. Goodbye.